Two thirds of the US economy is tied to how much consumers spend money. You can only afford to buy based on what you have in your pocket or what you believe you'll earn in the near future. Reporting on consumer spending over the last four years has indicated that the US consumer and the overall economy has been strong. The data reporting has backed this up, but is the data true or has it been manipulated by the system? And if the consumer has been so strong, why are Americans in more debt today than ever before? We ask these questions as more and more retailers and restaurants are closing their doors. So one might ask, what is the state of the U.S. consumer? Even if you're rich or doing well financially, you should still want to know, as historically the state of the consumer will direct any boom or bust economy. My guest today is an expert on the American consumer. She's an economist and her research firm's role is to help corporations understand the future of the economy. I hope you enjoy the show. Neely, welcome to our show. Thank you. It's so great to be here. You know, I'm curious, after spending 20 years on Wall Street, you co-founded consulting firm Distill, where you're currently the CEO. You were named top retail expert in 2024 by Rethink Retail, amongst a, a long list of accolades. In the public's view, Neely, you're well hidden, well, until now. Uh, can you tell us about your company, Distill, and what you do? Oh, I, it would be my joy. Um, you know, the Wall Street life is an interesting life when you are you know, walking alongside CEOs and boards and helping them tell their story, you know, with integrity, but also with um, kind of a long range imagination. I mean, that's really what an IPO process is, um, building relationships with those C-suites out of the gate. But there's only so far they can take you behind, you know, their their walls because you are someone who's out there in the public markets and you have a responsibility and there's certain information you're not allowed to know. But we certainly came across um, opportunities and insights where we were brought more and more into boardrooms to do education for the boards. And, and that just sparked our imagination. What if CEOs and boards had access to um, like rigorous, bespoke research that could truly help them grow and mitigate risk? And that's how we, that's how we developed Distill. We used our Rolodex. Um, I guess kids don't know what Rolodex is already wore, but we used our Rolodex um, to build those relationships and those years on Wall Street. But our joy has been just coming alongside and walking with CEOs and boards, building trust with their leadership teams and expanding the dialogue um, from what's normally or commonly said within a boardroom um, on matters of the, the consumer economy. That's That was the vision. That was the idea. Here we are seven going on eight years later, and um, it's still very much in the flow. Can you give us an idea of, you know, what are some of the businesses or who are they that you serve? Well, we, we make public some of our past clients, but you can understand, you know, we don't discuss our current clients. But some of our past clients have included um, Marisa's, which is a billion dollar plus retailer out of um, the Midwest of women's apparel. Um, really good and fine people there. Uh, we also have done some business with companies who are maybe stuck in a moment. Um, and Blue Apron was one of them. Smile Direct has been another one. Um, and, you know, those have been interesting engagements because of, you know, what has transpired since in their businesses. But where we tend to get engaged is, um, is at the moment when they're out of answers and they're a little bit more confused than clear. And that, that's usually the tip of the spear for our business as we come in and, and help educate around that confusion. Would you say the bulk of the clients that you've served have been in the retail space? Oh, yeah, for sure, for sure. But we do also have engagements with some of the B2B sales um, vendors, which makes sense because they're selling to the retailers and to the brands. And that's where some of our engagements will come in around just educating their sales force, their people, their team, making sure that they sound like they are the experts that they need to be for their retailers and their counterparts. So it isn't just, you know, we've done a couple of educational engagements with like Google, for example, Sensormatic, which is the owner of ShopperTrack. Track. 
kind of the the um, the primary tracking, uh, the traffic counters people of of mall based retail, um, and have excellent partnerships, you know, all around there too. So it is both the retailer as well as um, those that sell to retailers and looking for expertise. What would you say? You know, I guess there are a lot of roles on Wall Street. Many people don't necessarily understand it. You would think of, you know, maybe you were a stockbroker, but when you talk about going into boardrooms and things like that, what was your primary goal for 20 years on Wall Street? My primary goal was on the consumer research side, uh, equity research, sell side analyst. Um, these are some of the terms that are said about that role. And, you know, the sell sider gets to be really, really, really in depth with just a certain smaller group, a number of stocks and companies. So, for example, for anybody who's maybe new to this Wall Street world, this is how we explain it. Um, this is how I explain it in the classroom, because I, I think, you know, I also teach as a professor, too. Um, and, uh, the, you know, you've got the buy side, which they're charged with figuring out which of 3,000 stocks are going to go up or down. Um, and their expertise might lie in things like market movements and money flows and understanding bigger environmental um, factors like is oil, is this a good time to buy oil or not a good time to buy oil? Like they might have a different expertise on those environmental factors, those economic factors, but they can't simply be an expert of an individual company. They don't have the time. So they need to engage the sell side and the sell side, their job is to be really, 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 really deep and um, long in their knowledge on particular sectors and subsectors and, and companies overall. And the two need to work together, right, to make some good stock calls. Uh, it's not one versus the other. Sometimes I think people think that's uh, that they can do one without the other, but the reality is the sell side and the buy side ultimately really do need each other. Um, so my job was to be really, really, really nerdy and knowledgeable about just about 30 companies at any given point in time in my career. And that was um, a joy. It was truly a joy because I am as you've already pre-identified in a very kind way, I am a nerd. So yes. <laughs> I guess a lot of what your research entails is understanding demographics, consumer consumption. Um, and with the U S I mean, we're a big consumer based <laughs> you know, demographic. I mean, we buy a lot of stuff from, I mean, we're taught that way, right? We don't really make a lot anymore. We just buy a lot. Um, what is, I mean, is that, is that fair to say? I mean, when you're trying to tell where trends are going, I mean, you have to really understand the state of the consumer. You do. And, um, maybe said, uh, differently, um, to do the job well as a sell side analyst, you have to take a very long view of where long-term trends are going. Um, that's how, I have, per, I how, per, how I personally found to be very valuable to portfolio managers was the ability to look out five years and 10 years and not just the next quarter. And they appreciated that because they, they need time to do their work. They need time to do their research. They need time to kind of expand on your views. So to do that and to do that well, you do need to have a pretty decent sense of what's going on with demographics. And one of the things that um, I helped co-develop when I was at Piper Jaffray, which is now called Piper Sandler, is still very much in effect. It's a the longest longitudinal study of teen research behavior. And it's called Taking Stock with Teens. It was I was one of the original co-authors of this back in 2002. And um, to this day, it's still in existence and it goes on about every six months. And it is one of the longest demographic studies of teen buying behavior. So that's an example of creating a proprietary data set that, you know, frankly, could live beyond even my tenure over at Piper Sandler, but one that gave deep, 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 deep and unique insights about that, that buying demographic. So, Neely, what is the current state of the U.S. consumer? Wow, this is a big question. Um, and one, you're not surprisingly, I'm getting asked often. Uh, here's how I would start by saying a reminder that the consumer has always acted like many consumers for my entire career, my entire professional career, with the exception of the COVID era from the pandemic era. I think that's what's kind of tripping people up a little bit. They're expecting everybody to do the same thing at the same time in the same amount, in the same direction, and in the same way. 
because that's what we did when we shut down a consumer economy overnight and fired 24 million people in one month and put stimulus checks into their pockets. Everybody rushed to go find toilet paper, right? I mean, that was like the thing. And then everybody hunkered down for a while and then everybody learned how to make sourdough bread, right? Everybody, like everybody acted kind of in the same way. Um, and then we had the vaccinations that came forward and that kind of opened up the economy and that reintroduced people to restaurants. And then everybody wanted to dine out at the same month. And then everybody wanted to go to, you know, travel at the same month and everybody got married in 2022. So, you know, it was, the consumer has acted in a monolith, like monolithically. And, now that we're coming out of that and you have different consumer capacities to spend, consu- consumer life stages, you know, that are informing that we can walk through some of that. Um, it's it's not all acting the same. And <laughs> so the confusion is there. And we're we're here to help people navigate um, which consumer. So that's often the question I res- respond back, you know, how's consumer doing? And I'll say, which consumer? Which hmm. consumer do you want to talk about? Interesting. So what consumers, maybe we'll look at it this way, what consumers right now are experiencing the biggest pain points? For sure, the lower income, you know, that's the math on the amount that uh, food represents to your total consumption basket. You know, if you think about it, if you have a 200, I'm going to speak in extremes, if you have a $200,000 income, um, your discretionary spending dollars are significantly more. Um, but if you have a $20,000, you know, income, your discretionary spending dollars are much less. So you have more of what you need to buy versus what you want to buy, the lower income that you are totally makes sense. Right. Um, and that food pricing has just been just, just absolutely crushing the, um, that, that lower end, that lower bound consumer gas prices have been a little bit of a tailwind this year versus last year. Um, I, I believe it was last year where both food and gas were working against them. So, you know, the fact that you have, or in the last couple of years, so the fact that you have a little bit of alleviation from gas um, is probably good, but food and gas represent um, a fairly significant portion to a lower income consumer in terms of their consumption basket. So empirically, it's that consumer group. Uh, and then also we have been raising a little bit of the alarm this year on the young adult, kind of this 20 to 24 year old recent college graduates. We're calling them the financially fragile right now. Um, we're a little concerned about that group as well. And that's not as widely talked about or discussed, but it is, I would say, with our client base. When you say lower income, can you give, I mean, is, would you consider lower income middle class now? I mean, what define lower income? I would say sub 50 K for household, um, would be how we would look at it. I mean, I, there's so many nuances. I mean, <laughs> I know very well off people who report, uh, about 50 K right of their income. So, you know, uh, we have to be careful about what, <laughs> what we're determining by the reported adjusted gross income. But generally speaking, you're talking about, um, a dual, uh, a dual income household where someone's maybe making 16 to 25 and someone else might be making 25 to 35. This could be, um, you know, uh, food service workers or, you know, people who are working in the service industry. Um, it's never just one thing for sure, you know, in terms of income and, and different, there's, there's reports about how, you know, if you're making under 75, you're feeling the pressures of inflation still. And, and we agree with that. Um, empirically, you have to, when you look at the food component uh, or, or things like property tax increases, which are not reported by the way, in CPI. Um, so there's other ways that I think people are feeling pinched, but this would be a group of people who do not actually rely a lot of their income clearly coming from the stock market. They don't access the stock market. They don't necessarily have access to the 401k. They're not benefiting when they see increases um, in the stock market, unlike a retiree who might also be reporting an income under 50,000, but they might be gloriously, you know, kind of funded by their 401k and retirement funds. So it still does depend which persona you're looking at. Would you say the uh, the biggest enemy to this, um, you know, uh, lower income was inflation 
related? Was it uh, lack of wage growth over the last, you know, several years or maybe the past decade? I know they, uh, depending on the reporting that you uh, focus on, some say wage growth has been fantastic, but uh, would you say that uh, inflation, wage growth, or maybe the amount of debt that has been accumulated from excessive, unnecessary spending? I mean, if you had to drill down one of those categories, what, what would you think has been the biggest culprit? That is such a great question, Todd. I have not been asked to pinpoint which one is contributing the most. Um, but I think if I had to choose one, I would go, this may be... Um, this, this may be a silly answer to some, but I'm going to risk it. Risk it for the biscuit, as they say. I, you know, I think it's I think it's the categories that you see on a on a monthly and on a daily or a weekly basis. So we like to say that the consumer doesn't experience price increases every single month, like we read in CPI. So, for example, your healthcare insurance, you kind of have a sticker shock of that once a year. Or your auto insurance, you have a sticker shock of that once a year, or your property tax increases once a year, or maybe two times a year when you pay it, however that works for um, those who pay their property ta- property taxes. Um, but food is every week, and gas is every week, and your credit card bills and the in- egregious, you know, sort of interest rates associated with credit card bills, that's every month, but in some ways, kind of every week, because you're probably not paying that off, and therefore you're actually monitoring your capacity to spend on the card. There's some pretty clear evidence about that also going on. So I think it's probably definitely rate sensitivity on the credit card side and the capacity to um, get from out underneath debt, but also it's got to be food related um, as well because of the frequency of that purchase. And, And perhaps it's those auto insurance moments or the health insurance moments that kind of set someone over the edge, right? Like it's there under the surface and then you get that one extra bill, that one extra, you know, thing, and and it just kind of sets you off over the edge. So it's never one thing, but it's how they all come together. But you think that it's uh, primarily life's necessities that is playing the largest role in, you know, uh, maybe all of it consumer debt um and um the the fact that they're not making more money at their uh, current jobs that is correct that is correct we do think for that lower bound of the income group we do think it is that we do we do so let's talk about inflation and cpi because a lot of people are confused you're an economist um you know you probably understand this more than than most um uh, would you say that you know inflation is down as cpi reporting suggests well it's that classic you know inflation the rate of change versus price levels the absolute numbers um and no, look, I fully understand the math <laughs> and I fully understand the idea that, quote, inflation is coming down, right? That dynamic because it's the rate of change. I love the rate of change. You know, the second derivative has been my best friend in calling for, you know, stock calls in my 20 year career, right? On Wall Street. Um, however, to the consumer, it's a fatiguing thing to see. Um, you know, the absolute price remain at elevated levels when they still have muscle memory of when things were less expensive. With every year that passes, perhaps we, you know, kind of soften on that memory. But there is still this reminiscence of, you know, I used to be able to get my, you know, McDonald's breakfast for $3 or $4 or whatever it might be. I don't, I don't purchase it that often, but, um, and now it's seven. Right. There's there's still this reality of that price shock every time you see it on the absolute price. So I'm I'm not quick to dismiss price levels and how quickly they rose in such a short period of time and just say, well, everybody should just get over it right now. Like, no, you know, <laughs> no. Um, but also when you look at a long term chart of prices, you know, we're always in an upward trajectory. 
And recently, I just used an inflation calculator and went over some of the things like a McDonald's Big Mac meal or a dozen eggs or a house for that matter. And putting it into, I went from 1985 to 2024 and adjusting for CPI in, you know, or inflation, um, the costs were still an upwards of 74% higher than what should typically be a CPI inflation adjusted uh, price. So I guess the question is, you know, um, you know, can you tell us how does the Federal Reserve come up with CPI data? You know, is this a manipulated number? Is it something that's real? Is it a pie in the sky? I mean, you know, wh wh what's the deal with CPI? Um, really great question. So let me talk a little bit about methodology. Um, there are two, um, there's many ways to measure price, but there's two primary ones that, that are often quoted in the marketplace. You have CPI, which is the cost of um, the consumer price index, and that is prices observed. And then you have the personal consumption expenditure um, component, and that's like prices consumed. So it gets a little bit of a nuanced difference in terms of prices observed versus prices consumed. And there are things that show up in the PCE that don't show up in the CPI and vice versa. So they, they're not exactly the same basket mix either. But um, CPI, since we're talking about CPI, that is created by the Bureau of Labor Statistics in, um, and it is, and I'm, I, I'm fully familiar with folks who think, you know, it's always like a conspiracy with, <laughs> with, you know, the government reporting agencies. And I have had my own very public, you know, kind of terse words around methodology changes um, out there too. So I'm not, uh, I don't believe they wake up every day and say, how can we befuddle the U.S., you know, American people, right? Like, I don't think that they do that. And in fact, I have friends who work there. So, you know, <laughs> they're good people. Um, that said, there are some interesting methodology shifts that, that probably did affect how some of the reporting occurred. I'll give you a very brief example. So um, in 2020, you had a, a significant purchasing of toilet paper and a significant not purchasing, by the way, of gasoline, right? Like we did not actually consume a lot of gasoline because we did work from home and we just stayed home and everybody just stayed home, right? So just those two categories alone. Gasoline probably represents about, you know, 4% or so of the index, for example. Well, they don't just look at the price, they look at the weight, of what that goes into that basket. And in looking, I believe at the 2022 CPI data, they ended up kind of ignoring the 2020 like dynamic, which just ended up kind of influencing a little bit of how the pricing uh, worked on the overall index. It doesn't matter when it's a small category like toilet paper, but it could matter when it's a large category like gasoline prices or other categories. So that was um, that's a methodology. That's not um, a conspiracy. Um, and they're very public about their methodologies. So uh, I guess I'm more in that camp. But should we scratch our heads sometimes when we see, you know, their choice to do certain changes and certain methodologies at certain times? Sure. Um, but I, I, I don't I don't think they wake up thinking they want to, you know, befuddle the U.S. economy on a daily basis. It, it is sort of like a self-fulfilling prophecy, though, if they came out and, you know, uh, reported what I'm going to say, the truths of the state of the economy or, or uh, consumer behaviors. And I think a lot of it is, you know, hidden in backward looking data. And it just, it always befuddles me when I'm thinking, you know, the people that are running the show and that are calling the shots and manipulating things like interest rates or, you know, the overnight bank trading rate or, um, you know, performing bailouts or suggesting money printing or, you know, entering more dollars into circulation is doing so based on backward looking data. I mean, does that, does that, as someone that's as smart as you that understands math and modeling, I mean, does that surprise you? I mean, that, that in itself to me is almost, uh, more disturbing than, you know, um, than anything. Todd, you're exactly right. I mean, that is actually what can get called into question. 
this idea that we are consistently and continuously looking at uh, back data, right? Instead of looking at forward data and known lagging data, right? It's not even that it is data that is old, right? And behind us, but rather it's data that doesn't signal future. Um, it, employment is a great example of that. I would love to pull up a chart and show you one thing that could be um, really helpful. Like if I were the Fed, if someone were like, Neely, you are going to be part of the Fed today. Okay, well, here's one chart I think I would be, that would keep me up at night about my Fed policy. Okay, what we're looking at with this chart is looking at the year over year, um, we're looking at the year over year change of unemployment for the 20 to 24 year old. So we discussed that we were concerned about this particular demographic. And this is typically going to be post-college. A lot of the people involved in this um, chart have college educations. And what you're seeing is if it's low, if it's below that zero line, that means that unemployment is lower. If it's above, it means it's higher. Since February of this year, we've been seeing a significant uptick in the unemployment rate for both men and women, women being the lighter blue and men being the darker blue on the chart. And um, we've been seeing a significant uptick in the unemployment rate. We're talking like 200 basis points higher <laughs> in certain months. I mean, we, we, we get, you know, a little upset when we see a 20, 30, 50 basis point increase in the unemployment rate on the national level. But in some cases, you've got this demographic at an 8% unemployment rate, which is 2x that of the national average. Here's what concerns us, obviously, for this demographic. But is this a sign that companies pulled back on their hiring? Which we have evidence of in other data sets. You know, this was a leading indicator that we were going to be pulling back on our hiring data. And in fact, we've seen hirings come down. Um, and is that actually a sign that companies themselves are nervous about their future. They're not even willing to invest in their future employment of this demographic. Um, and, you know, is that a sign, you know, that they're pulling back and, and that rates might have been held too high for too long? We think yes. Um, but this is, you know, this is an example of uh, some data that I would look at. It's employment data, but is it a leading indicator of a particular type of um, behavior out of companies. And we, we think, yes. What's the specific disparity between men and women? Like, as I'm looking at your chart and, um, you know, where it switches, when you look at, you know, many months in 24, it was mostly women. And now when you're looking at towards the end of the year, uh, you're seeing the higher spike in men being unemployed. Is there, what, what, how do you explain that? That is a really great question. Um, we, the, initially, it's just conjecture. Let me just start it with that. It's just conjecture on our part because we just don't have simply exactly enough information to know for sure. But it is possible because if you look at the demographics of college education, you know, women actually outpace young men at this point in, in going to college. So that initial spike in that February of 2024, we think is an indication that corporations were simply not filling roles in kind of that professional white collar, you know, if you were sort of roles, you know, the uh, marketing interns, the the new marketing kind of people, the, the I mean, accountants always have a job, so it's not accountants. Um, but, you know, any of those other functions, maybe even project managers and what have you. So that kind of that those initial feeder roles into those corporate America um, positions, we think we're signaling with that pullback in the, the young women's uh, employment rate. Now, for young men, um, could it be that, you know, they were able to pull, if they do have a little bit more of trade-related jobs or what have you, could there have been maybe a little bit of a, a rehiring zone that happens for them kind of in that September timeframe, but then we saw it spike up again in October. So it's hard to know because it is such a small data set, it's hard to know exactly what's going on month to month, which is why you have to look at a broader trend of it and not just overly nitpick one month to month. Um, but, you know, young men, 
I, let's just say it this way. I look at that chart and it doesn't surprise me that politically speaking, you know, President Trump picked up a significant portion of that younger Gen Z male vote um, because they've, you know, they had a difficulty in that spike up right on the unemployment rate, too. So they're seeing it in their own personal um, demographic overall. And yeah, when I looked at that and I saw the the results of the election, it just it didn't surprise me. Who's doing the bulk of the consumer consumption right now? Retirees, very likely retirees, retirees, um, probably Gen X, even though they're very small, you know, relative to the others. I mean, you've got, you know, 65 million or so uh, baby boomers to the 45 million or so Gen Xers, just, you know, rough, rough chop at the numbers. Um, But Gen X is very, very employed, you know, like both people are employed. They're at like peak kind of earnings years on the younger Gen X side. Um, They are also, you know, starting to become empty nesters, you know, so the, 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 that pressure to provide for the family is becoming less and less on the Gen X side. Um, And now they're heading into on the older Gen X side, they're heading into grandparent age um, and starting to have their first grandkid. But on boomers, man, they are just you know, you know, they own their homes free and clear, right? And I say homes because it's plural in many cases. Um, they're, the stock market could not be more glorious. I was just at a conference and, you know, all the topic was like, oh, I'm so glad I got that pop in the election. Now I can actually do my RMDs. You know, I mean, so it's, uh, you know, I I think that they're they're happy when the stock market's happy. When the stock market doesn't, though become happy there's an immediate pullback on spending out of the retirees i mean they feel it yeah well i'm not going to let you get away without talking about the stock market so i I do have uh i do want to bring that up in a little while here um so you're saying retirees are doing the bulk of the the consumption what sectors are benefiting the most from that travel certainly would be you know one of them um we can see some of that Not broad-based travel, but like for sure, you know, cruises definitely had their moment. Um, And I'm not making any sort of investment call here. That is not what I'm doing, Todd. I know you probably want me to do that. I cannot do that. I will not do that. Um, Anything can change at a dime. But uh, restaurants were doing really well for a while too. And then actually that pulled back this year. So it's it's interesting. It's almost like um, they were benefiting from everybody feeling flush. And now the only people probably picking up the check might be the baby boomer grandparents um, at the dinner table. Um, Travel, engagement, um, having fun on your vacations, having spending down in your Florida, you know, second home, right? I mean, that's, that's where we think the retirees are spending. And it's really not talked about, but a lot of these Retirees did actually help their their millennial older, you know, millennially the grandchildren or depending on where they are on the boomer curve, they were helping with down payments on houses, you know. So um, there's this de facto spending that kind of happened or this kind of subversive sort of spending that occurred out of that demographic that might have been attributed to millennial spending, but actually it was coming from the pocketbooks of boomers. There's some evidence around that. Yeah, I've witnessed that firsthand. You know, as a real estate broker, mm-hmm. what sectors would you say are struggling right now? I mean, I know you mentioned restaurants. I see a lot of restaurants closing. Uh, if you had to, you know, point at one of the the largest struggling um, sectors, what would that be? Restaurants, for sure. I mean, I mean, even I think there was an article out this morning as we're you know um, talking here about how the retail bankruptcy or the restaurant bankruptcies were really, really quite high this past year, which makes sense. Um, I don't know about you, but we're seeing it even in our local market. We're seeing it with kind of the ma and pa restaurants are not able to kind of keep up with the demands of the costs to run their business as well as, you know, kind of think about the corporate taxation type situation. There's no more stimulus really coming from the employee retention tax credits. Um, and I think they're just saying we got we got to close up shop. Restaurant margins, as you know, I'm sure are not high to begin with. You know, so you're on thin margins. Um, 
So yeah, restaurants for sure have been underperforming. Any of the interest rate sensitive groups, I mean, for a long time this year, building materials actually was an underperforming group as well. So think, you know, the Home Depots and the Lowe's of the world. Um, retail sales this past month looked a little bit more robust, but it could have been hurricane kind of related mm-hmm. on the rebuild side. Um, but that's something we're watching are the interest rate sensitive categories that could also be large ticket furniture, um, large ticket electronics, you know, those types of um, interest rate sensitive purchases. Interesting. A lot of reporting has, you know, been put out over the last four years about how we've had the strongest economy and that the consumers are the strongest that they've been in decades. And, um, but yet we see where consumer debt has exploded to the highest levels, um, defaults are, you know, all time highs. Um, the forbearance programs have just been simply mind boggling Mm -hmm. on keeping people, you know, out of foreclosures, and extending their loans through modifications, uh, you know, going from 30 to 40 year uh, mortgage modifications for FHA and VA borrowers, um, you know, taking a third of their or 30% of their mortgage payment and putting it in a non interest uh, second mortgage that reduces their payments. But yet we still see where, you know, the bulk of the economy, I would say, is still very sensitive to this high prices that we've experienced over that same period, the last four years or so, not relating this to political affiliation. I'm just stating facts. Um, how has the stock market been able to do so well despite the fact that um, consumers seem to be doing not so well? Well, we've had some great, you know, innovation, right, within technology. I mean, I'm not here to pump AI or chip technologies or, you know, anything to that effect. But uh, the the sheer rise and adoption of this new concept of the LLMs, which have been around for a while, but really hitting that commercialization, I, I, you know, clearly is one of the reasons why the stock market has done so well. Like, you know, I, I'm not here to rehash the the debate of, you know, was the stock market led by the seven stocks or, you know, what have you. But it was clearly concentrated and concentrated in areas of innovation. And I think to some extent why we've seen this continue on the other side of a, a Trump presidency announcement is because there's some belief that we will continue to have American-dominated um, innovation and growth and manufacturing. We'll see. You know, I mean, there's 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 conversations, there's plans, um, but that's certainly what the market is voting for, as well as for um, a rate market to kind of come back down to normalcy and not remain so high. Um, you know, I think for me personally, it's still a lot of TBD. I try to stay as neutral as possible in all things related to fiscal policy because um you know there there can be all all sorts of reasons why things can go well or can go poorly relative to expectations and it's important to kind of just stay vigilant on the critical thinking here but the market's telling you that's what its expectations are now we need to see the delivery the follow through um of that so we'll see yeah, I, I think that was well said. Uh, as someone that whose business depends on uh, predictability and being able to provide the right data to your clients um, so that they can win, not lose, so they can come out on the positive side of the expectations that are even, you know, um, on the midterm, I'd say midterm being that five year period that you're trying to, you know, accurately predict. What role, I guess, you know, when you're as someone that is uh, so experienced with the um, the Wall Street mentality, I think that probably in your 20 year tenure, you have seen the effects on Wall Street of the Greenspan Fed put and how the changes have, you know, um, you know what that meant for the confidence level of the stock market and the too big to fail organizations. And sort of like the games that, um, I don't want to say manipulation, but in some ways I feel it is manipulation. Um, But 
how closely in your role do you follow the Fed and their moves or what their um what they can and cannot do and whether it will or will not continue to work? It's a great question. Um we're obviously we watch the Fed like anyone would, I think, when you have to stay close to it because it has been such an impact on the market. I mean, it's 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 clear in just interest rates broadly and consumption, therefore, right? Um, we do. We do watch it very closely. And we even watch, you know, tiny little nuances like it's the May 10 year auction that actually determines the annual um, direct loan federal um, rate for student loans. Right. I mean, so there's so you got to watch the Fed meeting that happens right before that. I mean, so we, we there's implications to even when they are discussing different things that can have uh, consumer implications on the capacity to spend as just for example. The, I think the bigger issue is going to be um, kind of what happens with the the 2017 the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act renewal or not. You know what do we do on taxation overall um, under the Trump administration? What what he's able to get done and what that how that affects the consumption public. So we we studied that very very closely. That was actually when we were launching our consultancy was back in the TCJA of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017. We made um, pretty uh, contrarian calls at that point in time, too, for our clients, because if you will recall, we were pre-realizing those tax savings all year in 2018. So when you went to go file your taxes in 2019, you were surprised to the downside as a consumer um, with how tax withholdings were being withheld. We had made that call for our clients all year. And that was helpful because they could realize there weren't there was going to be disruption in in 2019. And in fact, hmm. that was a horrible Q1 for retail sales. So we follow tax policy very, very, very closely because the consumer cares about um, how much is coming out of their pocket on a paycheck to paycheck period. But they also care about what happens at tax season when they go to file. And we we monitor that by like a hawk, actually. So. I would say that's where we're going to be more focused is on the fiscal policy dynamics versus um, just monetary policy. j is going to do what j is going to do, and we will follow along and <laughs> translate the implications along the way. But to predict, not our game. We're much better sticking with our uh, trusty HP 12C and Microsoft Excel and calculating <laughs> fiscal uh, policy impacts for our clients. Yeah, it makes sense. You know, a lot of people don't realize in 2019, I think we were headed straight into a recession. Um, I, I don't think a lot of people realize just how the, and, and look, I'm not downplaying, and this sounds even awful to say, but how opportunistic 2020 became in the midst of a, of a pandemic, because shy of all of that stimulus and printing, you know, all of the dollars that were printed and getting it out shy of that happening we were probably looking at a massive recession in 2020 uh i mean do you agree with that 100 percent, todd um some of my favorite um market observers and economy um observers would agree with that statement as well i mean so that is to me that's a little bit of a uh, a litmus test as to how closely people really stay critically thinking on <laughs> their data. Did you believe that 2019 was headed towards a recession or not? That's a that's a little bit of a, a litmus or a Turing test for me. Um, and I agree with you. We empirically we were headed in that direction. We were signaling that um, with some of our clients because of what happened with the Q1 retail sales. And uh, yeah, we agree. I mean, so I guess the question is, and not you know, from a a prediction standpoint, but just a, a factual, just looking at all the data, are we headed towards a recession now? I don't know, but I do know that recessions begin in the small, in the micro before they become in the macro, right? Um, by the time it hits an, a broader economy, it's too late. It It will start in an industry. It will start in a demographic. Um, the one that we have been probably chastised <laughs> or chided, I guess, for um, being so steadfast in our belief is on the student loan repayment. Yeah, you know, the student loan repayment, I think, is going to be 
super fascinating to watch that come through um, because it has been pretty much effectively in deferment since March of 2020. I mean, when you don't have the consequences in play for not repaying, you're effectively telling people that they can not pay. Um, and while some have been in repayment over the last year, October 2023 is when it kind of officially went back into repayment. Some repaid, but some clearly are not. And even this year, some have pulled back on paying as early as that July-ish sort of time frame. And they haven't really started to repay again. We're concerned about that um, and what the, the implications of that could be on the consumer economy, especially if you have that 20 to 24 age demographic in a higher unemployment rate, if they can't, you know, have their job and, you know, it just could just end up being very recessionary for discretionary spending on that young adult financially fragile group. So we're, we're, we are concerned about that. You want, you want me to show you a picture? Sure. All right, here we go. You can see this is um, the annualization on a trailing 12 month basis of uh, student loan repayments or, or deposits basically into the department of education. And we have it going all the way back to 2016. Here is that 2020 that my cursor's on that 2020 sort of time frame, And, you know, that's when that early beginning to start to pull back on paying because of you were in deferment. Well, since then, we've been in deferment and starting that repayment. So here's 2023 kind of bottomed out on our repayments. And now we're starting to October timeframe and paying it off in that September to avoid interest, you know, for some of the, the, the good loan repayers. And then here we are kind of beginning that continuation where my cursor is there. And here we are in that July-ish sort of time frame, and all of a sudden we started to see a pullback. The question we have, and there's no reason to be, by the way, unless people just feel like they cannot pay and they didn't have the penalty to pay. Yeah. So I guess we're asking this question fairly out loud um, and publicly around whether or not people, the retail sales strength or the consumer spending strength that we're seeing, is it completely unborrowed time you know at this point mm. um especially with a trump presidency and believing that he will actually enforce the student loan repayments yeah i think to your point a lot of people were expecting that their student loans would be forgiven and that's what was being sort of broadcast and you know i mean look you're right also that the ones that are owning up to the fact that they owe this debt and that their inner core is only satisfied in repaying their obligations that they've committed to, they those uh, folks took advantage of interest-free loan opportunities and continued to pay their payment where you know it went all to principal debt, not interest, right? But you had this cohort that... Um, was saying, you know what? Um, hey, if they're going to forgive this debt, well, I'm not going to pay it back. Why should I be penalized? And I think a lot of people have felt that watching the amount of stimulus and handouts and you know propping up uh, of telling people that, hey, you know what? You can commit to things and you don't have to worry about the consequences if you can't make your payments. We saw that with mortgages and so many people you know, the question is, should people buy houses? Shouldn't they buy houses? I mean, there are certain people that believe that say, hey, if you have $400 in a bank account, you should not own a home because you can't afford something that breaks. You know, God forbid something will happen. And then there's the other side of it where they're saying, you know what, as long as you can make the monthly payments, why waste the money to landlords? So it's like we're teaching the wrong principles and we're wondering why we're getting the results that we're getting. Um, if we're going to look at the economy and, you know, and in my business, we're looking at, you know, a lot of people are shocked. They're like, well, you know, home sales are down the 40, 50 year lows. Well, no kidding for the many of the reasons that are so obvious, um, you know, people don't have the money. They can't afford the interest rates. They can't, you know, afford the home asset prices. But if we're going to look forward for the next five years, 10 years or whatever, I mean, obviously we have to have hope 
in you know something that happens that changes this economic trend. And a lot of what you describe, Neely, is um, focusing on understanding those demographics. And I've heard you say that there's a lot that affects that. There's stages of life. There's income, and even I've even heard you say that in some ways your political affiliation can affect you know demographics. Um, before I I go on with this, can you just sort of you know explain that? Well, um, explain what as far as you know how these uh, changes in life, the demographics, how the you know stages of life. Um, you know, how, you know, income and all these types of things play into the expenditures, you know, the consumption that we have in the U.S. Absolutely. So all consumer spending begins with an economic reality and it is influenced by an economic or a life stage priority, right? And your priorities shift as you age and you have different experiences. One very positive thing that might come out of this current scenario you know because i'm not i'm not a perma bear right i'm just just a gal with a calculator who needs to signal some risk from time to time right but one very positive thing and we're seeing it more anecdotally than um in the numbers at this point and that is this generation this younger demographic they've grown up looking and comparing themselves, you know, to all things on social media. And so where you and I kind of probably grew up in the era of MTV cribs, you know, we got to see inside everyone's refrigerator of the celebrities that we saw, right? Like that was the most we got to see inside the homes of celebrities was their refrigerator and MTV cribs. The, this entire generation that is graduating from college right now, they have been growing up, you know, in the living room of the Kardashians. And so... Their ideas around what living looks like has been absolutely formed by false, um, false realities, in, in my opinion. And that is that you graduate from college and you can live in this like penthouse worthy, Instagram worthy apartment all by yourself. Like no time in economic history, literally not, not at all, not, not ever have we graduated from college and received our job and lived by ourselves like we typically cohabitated you know back in the 70s you would cohabitate right three's company <laughs> think about the show um you either lived with your parents until you were married or you lived with a couple girls in a house right and that's what you did you lived with other people you lived with roommates this idea this notion that you can just live by yourself in your own home right after college that is not anywhere in the history of economic behavior, life stage behavior. So perhaps what we're going to get is a reversion back to normal on what it is to cohabitate, which, by the way, could be exceedingly bullish for that age demographic because it will instantly free up kind of dollars to spend away from buying a home and a mortgage and all the things, all the things that break, you know, in your house to, you know, clothes and cars and joy um, and travel. So we're not, we're watching for that prioritization shift, you know, with one kind of swing to pendulum to one side, you might actually get the swing to the other side to not stay vigilant would be to miss that trend. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah. Well, we're, we watched it being forced it, in a lot uh, of ways where we saw millions of millennials move back home with mom and dad or a grandparent and you know, somebody that has, uh, that serving, you know, home buyers and sellers, we're also seeing in my career a record number of um, multi generational housing again, where we're seeing the parents and the grandparents buy the house, move in to a portion of it, whether it's an in law suite or a finished basement or a wing. And then their money is really what secured the, the property, and the uh, younger generations are, are living there as well. So that's that's a very interesting point. When we when we look at uh consumers being we started off saying that consumers Americans are consumers. Let's let's just say. I mean, we we have been just like you indicated with Instagram and TikTok and the pressures 
nowadays is you know 150 outfits and you know 50 pairs of shoes or whatever um you know way more stuff than we need um i've heard you say that uh the bulk of the consumer spending because we need this right if if in order to be the united states of america we have to have money to consume products goods and services wall street depends on it these companies are providing these products, goods, and services. I've heard you say that the ones that spend the most amount of money are those in their 40s somethings uh, because they're the ones that are, you know, they have children or maybe it's 30s to mid 30s to 40s. What kind of a concern? Because when I look at the millennials today, first of all, a lot of people are very angry at boomers and Gen Xers because they feel like their future was robbed. Um, that there are opportunities that for a 25 year old today is nothing like it was for 25, my 25 years of age back then. Is it a concern that we're moving this large demographic of millennials into that 35 to 45 year somethings where they have less money than we did, yet that's the biggest bulk of demographic that spends the most amount of money what what do you have to say about that? You know, um, I love millennials and I love all the generations. I think I need to to be really clear. I'm not um, I never shade one generation or another. And I, I'm always it always intrigues me when I watch that that happens. Um, you know, is it a is it a clickbait narrative, you know, that kind of perpetuates itself? Um, but I'm always inspired, actually, by younger generations. And I feel like our older generations do actually deserve our honor because I think they do have life wisdom. So I just want to make sure that that's kind of clear before I, you know, delve into this. Um, millennials onboarded into their adulting years much later and they were forever dubbed the entitled generation. You might remember that kind of in that 2010 to 2015 timeframe. Oh, they're so entitled. You know, they come into the workplace. Oh, they're so entitled. And we had done a fairly deep dive study, and we actually wrote a whole white paper about this um, and that our clients have in our library. And it's really around the years of consumption influence, like where they were between the ages of 16 to 22, were when they saw, you know, unemployment double in six months on several occasions, you know, they saw their um, family members lose homes. I mean, they ha they actually were kind of PTSD from a lot of financial, you know, situations. It's not uncommon for them to come into a workplace, especially early on and say, hey, when can I get promoted? Not because they felt like they were owed it, but rather they needed the assurance that it was going to happen. And so for millennials, we think that they're triggered more on that anxiety to assurance sort of continuum. And now that they've aged a little bit, now that they've had their one to one and a half kids, maybe. I don't know. I don't know where the, the number's shaking out there. They're in a home. They're in their sense of place. Um, one thing that's that we're observing is we believe their divorce rate actually is significantly lower than generations before them. And so as a result, you know, we're looking for, like I told you, we love to look out really, really long-term on some of our long-term trends. This is an area of study for us where we are um, assessing Will they actually end up with longer lifetime earnings because their divorce rate actually has been lower? You know, divorce is costly. So um, whereas the boomers, you know, the divorce rate was significantly higher with boomers at that same sort of age demographic. So we're, we're watching that closely. Um, I can't say that we've formed a complete opinion about it, but that's just one area where the optics of today may not actually be the optics of tomorrow, the reality of tomorrow because of that um, family dynamic. And then they will, you know, secured in their employment. Um, and yeah, I know, I'm pretty hopeful. My business partner is a millennial, um, like born in that peak year. And I see the way that she conducts and lives her life. And I have a tremendous regard actually for that um, and how her friends, how they all interact. And um, yeah, no, I, I'm actually pretty bullish on millennials. They might, they might actually care uh, for our baby boomer grandparents more than <laughs> The Gen Xers. I don't know. We'll see. <sighs> yeah, that's interesting to hear you say. I mean, I I work with a lot of first time buyers that are millennials, and 
and I see, you know, um, I, I see two sides of it. I, I see they're 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 graduating. They've graduated college. They're still carrying a lot of the college loan debt. Um, they're struggling to make, um, you know, decent pay. Uh, you know, it's it, it, I don't see very many of them coming out. And, and you know, in our area in Maryland, um, we're sort of you know we're 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 almost like this this different characteristic nationwide because we have a lot of government employees insurance uh, employers are big here in Maryland but we do see a huge disparity in salary range where if you're not making $150,000 in a combined household income here you're really not buying a house um and that's crazy when you look at you know the national averages of income and, um, but I, I see the millennials and I love the millennials. Don't get me wrong. I, 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 I never sh- should, I think that we should look down on our, um, you know, our, our younger generation, because that is our hope. They will be the ones that are, um, taking care of us when we age. Right. So we want them to prosper. We want them to do well. We want them to have the same opportunities, but I see with asset prices, um, you know, have so far outpaced wages, wage growth, that I don't see where they have a lot of room to turn. And, you know, and so the hope is that, you know, and these ages, you know, and and just to, you know, not push back, but just to, to say that as someone that owned a house at 24 years of age, myself, you know, and, and that had a lot of different opportunity in an economy that was booming, you know, back in the 90s, the early 90s, even though there were some economic struggles, we didn't see the asset prices so out of touch today. I mean, my gosh, Neely, we have automotive expenses at over $100,000 for a truck or a SUV or what, or close to that. This is insanity, right? So um, it is, I, I am just kind of curious just to, you know, just to kind of probe a little deeper. How do you expect these millennials to make more money in an environment where the predictability is probably that uh, businesses are going to try and cut labor costs as much as they can to continue to deliver the profits to their shareholders and their C-suite executives. Oh, super fair. Um, I, and I just want to ground something because millennials are so large, you know, kind of which component or continuum of millennials that we're speaking about. We're thinking more that kind of 35 to 45, you know, sort of time zone, you know, of age zone of millennials. Um, there's still, though, a kind of 35 to 27 sort of group that is probably what you're speaking to, right? That's precisely, um, yeah, fair enough. So they're, 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 and it, it's so large of a generation. You really do have kind of a tale to generations within millennial. I think they call the one group the Xennials because they're closer to the X's, and the other group is like the younger millennials. Um, so this is a situation where I think we're both right. Um, and, and it, what will, be fascinating though from my vantage point would just be i've always kind of put a little bit of a question mark out there about the the great wealth transfer um mainly because so much wealth gets consumed in those final years to healthcare you know if anybody's watched a, a family member go through that they know and just even the dynamic of how going into a long-term care facility, it used to be you had to show, I think, a certain level of income. Now they actually want to see your full assets and you're basically writing over your assets to these long-term care facilities. And um, so you have brought this up and I think it's such a great point. We also write about this um, as well, this aging in place, this this kind of multi-generational living. What's also behind it is a hopeful way of actually possibly transferring some of that wealth by not having it fully absorbed, you know, in those kind of final call it 18 months of someone's life because, you know, your assets get written off to the long-term care facility. And I don't think a lot of people, unless they've lived it, I don't think that a lot of people in the financial community really understands that there there was a shift. I mean, there was a shift in how long-term care facilities would um, build their kind of own financial models and and so it's 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 another way of saying i think that millennials can hang on to more wealth over the long haul if they remain mostly married right um as well as uh um attached and near to their wealthier grandparents in a way that can give care while aging in place 
And that will possibly set up for that wealth transfer. Like I would be willing to walk back some of my anti-wealth transfer comments if we continue to see that multi-generational living and aging in place. You know, I love that. I think, uh, you know what, as someone that uh, did live with their grandparents, you know, um, when my mom and dad split up, right, and my mom moved back home and, and um, you know, I think uh, maybe, you know, may- maybe you just stumbled upon something that really is valuable to put out there that um, along with the adjusting of our expectations is really come to the realization that the really for many now some can't be close to family for whatever personality reasons and i understand that too there's a reason why some kids move you know 1500 miles away from their their parents when they get old enough to do so but i think you know hoping that that's the few and not the many that there may be a lot of real prosperity in acknowledging the fact that we do need to come back to some kind of a grounded reality in this uh, United States of America, that we don't need everything. And what we really need more is our mental health. And a lot of times if we can, you know, get over those barriers that we're trying to keep up with our friends, instead of, you know, looking at what the, some of the best, um, you know, moves would be for ourselves and our future, would be to, like you said, you know, not be so uh, ashamed of moving back home with mom and dad at 30 years old after college, after getting your master's or your MBA or whatever it is that even still, you know, well, how am I an MBA still living at mom and dad? But just looking at it from an aspect of these could be your best chances of overcoming any kind of downturns in an economy, which we have and have had for hundreds of years in a cyclical fashion. Um, let's turn to and and sort of wind up here the presidency. Obviously, we just had an election uh, and the country voted for Donald Trump and or at least the ideals of the hope of prosperity off of what a lot of people have felt over the last four years or feeling like maybe the country has has been going down the wrong path, not being on the political side of things, but just on the hopeful side of things and forgetting the fact that there's such a divide, politically speaking. How has your business model, if at all, changed with the reality of a new administration and a complete different, um, potentially different set of rules over the next four years, you know, what has that meant for your, uh, your thinking, your planning, the direction of, of, uh, your business? Uh, so great. Um, again, we were, uh, launching our consultancy during the last, the beginning of the last, um, Trump presidency, right? So we actually have a database of knowledge of research because we studied it back then and we're just dusting it off and using it for now, which is, inter- you know, that was helpful to helpful to have um, the notes that we took back in that 2016, 2017 timeframe. Um, we do think it's ultimately going to be about that fiscal policy moves and we're going to, uh, and how they incentivize manufacturing and certainly the tariff conversation is going to be closely watched and, and analyzed to the nth degree. Everyone's going to become a tariff expert, right? But um, one, one thing that I think is very fascinating to us is how much standstill was occurring at, at a lot of companies um, behind closed doors. I mean, it's not just our business. We had it heard it across the board with other consultants and um, and other businesses. We're also, um, yeah, we're you know we're very familiar with just a variety of different consultants in in kind of the boardroom, and so many people did not move forward on consultancy contracts in kind of that April to now sort of time frame because it was viewed very much as a binary outcome in terms of was it going to be a Harris economy or was it going to be a Trump economy? And um, I think companies are still trying to figure that out. Like what exactly is going to be the supply chain um, initiative that you need to put into play if you remove kind of the ability to effectively operate out of certain countries at certain rates for certain categories. Here's where I'm hopeful though. Like 
we're not coming off the back foot on supply chain. Like we actually have muscle memory and people and organizations that know how to move forward in um, momentum. This is not new, right? The, A, it's not new with Trump on tariffs, and it is also not new on having to quickly move around the supply chain. Will, will there be glitches? Very likely, you know, will we hear about it in the 2025 um earnings releases. Yes, I think we will. Um, but also I just, I'm more optimistic about heading into this period of uncertainty to now certainty because we just have more, just like me, I had notes on how to, how to run it, you know, from 2016, 2017 timeframe, you have a lot of smart people behind closed doors that, um, have a lot of scar tissue around how to navigate these changes in the supply chain. So we'll see. We'll see how it moves forward. Um, I will always bet. I will never bet against America. I know it seems cliche to say that, but it is true. I I love the American people. I think that we are um, a hopeful uh, nation. Um, It may not feel that way to half the nation right now, but like we are a hopeful nation. And um, yeah, I just wouldn't bet. I just wouldn't bet against the American people. Well, Neely Taminga, you are a brilliant mind, and what an honor it has been to uh, to interview you, and uh, you're welcome back here anytime. Thank you, Todd. It was such a joy to spend time with you today. Really, really admire you, and um, this, this, I'm really glad that we finally got to do this. Yeah, well, I'm glad that we connected on X, and all of your links are in the show notes below, and uh, I can't encourage people enough to follow you and uh, really become familiar with you i you know i think you have a lot to offer consumers and we i certainly hope we get to hear from you more thank you very much have a great day we'll talk to you soon well thanks so much for making it to the end of this video i hope you enjoyed neely taminga as much as i did and if you did you can let us both know by smashing that thumbs up if you haven't already subscribed to sexualty's youtube channel consider doing so now and please take this opportunity to share us with your family and friends Keep the comments coming. I love reading them and see you next time. Sachs Realty, Maryland Broker, number 607720, office number 443-318-4514, equal housing opportunity.